Father God, speak to us today through your word. And uh, whatever you have to say, let it stay pure through my lips. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay, today we're going to talk a little bit about God with us, assaying, and skimming off the draw. Dross. Yes, assaying is in the scriptures. Assaying is in the scriptures. And the first uh, text we'll go to is in the book of Jeremiah. Should be right after Isaiah. Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Be in chapter 23. Okay, I've taught that this book, this King James Bible, is the closest you will ever get to Jesus Christ on earth before he returns for his bride. Now, today we're going to try. My words in the fire. I'm going to try my words in the fire just like we assay in the fire. And see what else this book of life besides the Son Jesus is. Now, this amazing book, the word of life. And uh, try my words in fire. Let's go to Jeremiah 23, 29 and see what God says here. 23, 29. Because we have to know what God considers his word. What does God consider his word? 23, 29. Is my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock to pieces? Yes. This, like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Yes. This, this, this book, the words in this book are that powerful. just smash rocks to pieces and I mean literally too as we'll see but anyhow then we're going to go back to the book of Matthew 1820 to see what else this book is Matthew 1820 so we're in the first book of the new day of Matthew 1820 1820 And this, these are the words that Jesus said when he was on earth. So it came straight out of Jesus' mouth, God's mouth. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So if we believe this book, his pure perfect words, and we're gathered here around this book in his name, he's here with us. He hears everything we say. He knows everything we think. So if even two of us are here, if only two of us are here, according to his words here, if only two of us are here, believing this book, he is here. Believing this book and speaking about him, meeting him, where he's here. So always remember that when we study his words. He hears and assays every word we think and say. as we'll look and prove in this study. Now, today, amazingly enough, we may be the only meeting this morning in this country of Suriname, and maybe some, maybe some other countries around us, that God is actually with us in this meeting. Oh, you know how powerful this, this book is? So let's go, let's go and look at that. God with us, that's in the book of Matthew 1. Go back to Matthew 1, a couple pages here. Matthew 1, 23. Matthew 1, 23. And God said here was actually a prediction about, about Jesus Christ being born. God in the flesh. Is behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, 
which being interpreted is God with us. Emmanuel's here. God with us. God with us. Emmanuel's Jesus. God with us. The Father hears us when we teach from his word too. God with us. It's a Godhead. Three in one. Now let's go over to the book of John. John 6. John 6. And how do we know that? Go to the book of John 6. And we'll go to verse 63. Now, remember, the, the Godhead is uh, uh, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That comes from 1 John 5, 7. Remember that. Now here we're in John 6, 63. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. That's the Holy Ghost. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. This is Jesus said this. They are spirit, they are life. And his words are now in this book right in front of us. We have spirit and life right in front of us. So this book is God's spirit. The Holy Ghost Jesus left with us. This book is life. Jesus also said, I am the life. Remember? Jesus said, I am the life. This book is life. How do we know Jesus is here? Because he said, I am life. And that's in John eleven twenty five. Just go a little bit over and look at it here. John eleven twenty five. 25. Now, Jesus was talking to Martha here. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So Jesus is not only the resurrection and the life, but also the word. We know that from, from, from right at the beginning of the book of John. So it, it, in, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. So if you have another... If you have corrupt words, these words are pure and perfect, which we talked about last week and I think the week before. These words are pure and perfect. If you have another word or another Bible version, a corrupt Bible version, you've got a corrupt Jesus. And if you've got a corrupt Jesus, you've got a corrupt salvation. So that's, that, that's, that's a big problem. So a false Jesus is a false salvation. John 14, 6. We're in the book of John. Let's stay there. 14, 6. Go over a couple more pages. 14.6 Jesus saith unto him I am the way the truth there we got it again uh, we've got a witness scripture I am the way the truth right in front of us and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me there's no other way to get to heaven but by Jesus Christ through this book if you speak English or understand English there's no other way to heaven not through a pastor not through a church not through, through a denomination, not through religion. There's no other way. So this book is the way, the closest we can get to the Holy Ghost and Jesus here on earth. But don't forget it's the Godhead, so either one of them could be here. The way to heaven. Okay, now we're going to go over to the book of Hebrews. Talk more about the word. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. For the word. That's Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, piercing even, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Do you know the spirit, the Holy Ghost is in you when you're saved? Do you know where your soul is? It's up in heaven. It's been divided. 
I can show you that in some other scriptures. We talked about it two weeks ago, actually. So what is God for us today? Go to Luke 4. Go back to Luke. Luke 4. What is God for us today? And the interesting thing is this was taken out of all the new Bibles. Luke 4. All the new Bible versions. It's gone. Luke 4. Verse 4. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written. It is written. So it's written. It's right here in front of us. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And every word of God is gone in the new versions. They don't want you to have that witness scripture. They don't want you to know it. We've got to live by every word of God. So if we don't know his words, we don't know him. So every word of God is in this book, but almost all new Bible versions took this out. Are the books they call Bibles anyhow. Now Luke 8, we're in the book of Luke, so let's go over to Luke 8, 8, 11. And we're going to see, because we know a lot of pastors are asking for our seed money. Luke 8, 11. Now God was speaking in a parable, of course, and he explained to his disciples what the parable meant. Because no one else understood it. Now modern pastors and churches don't understand it either. Luke 8, 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The seed is the word. The seed is not money. The seed is the word. So next time you're a pastor or you're an apostle, if you're in a church with a, and a pastor or apostle, ask you for seed money, quote him, a, quote him a scripture out of this verse. You've given him a seed. That's all he gets from you. Quote him a scripture. Try, trying to memorize, you know, four or five scriptures, just quote one to him. And then Luke, 8, uh, Luke 11, 28. Luke eleven twenty eight. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So if you hear it, get some of those words in your heart so you can keep them. Don't just listen in your head. Get some of them in your heart. So do you keep this book with you in your heart? Or do you allow... A version, a Bible version with mistakes to deceive you. Don't let everyone, anyone throw another Bible version in your face. And if they do, go to all those scriptures I taught you and, sh and show them their error. Show them their error. And then back to John 8. John 8. Or actually forward a bit to John 8. John 8, 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not. So if you're sitting in a church building and you don't hear God's words, they don't sink in, it's because you are not of God. And most pastors today are not of God. Most churches today are not of God. So if you're of God, you're going to hear these words. And know that this book is the third part of the Godhead. And also the closest we will get to God here on earth. So let's go over the book of Colossians. Colossians. Colossians 2. Two, we're going to start in verse 8. Because this is what churches are doing to us today. Well, certainly the majority of them. 95 plus percent. Two, eight. Beware. Least any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So what would be traditions of men? The teaching to speak in tongues, teaching to be water baptized. Those are all traditions of men. Teaching to sprinkle babies, all traditions of men. 
going into the, the house of God on Sunday, tradition of man, that's not a house of God, that's just a building. We're in the house of God right now because we're together. We can be out in the middle of the rainforest. God is with us. We're, we're in his name. They don't have houses of God in church buildings. So, verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You see that word Godhead? You ever hear uh, churches tell you about oh, the Trinity, Trinity? You know the Trinity is an idol? Yet, you go into any church building today, they're going to teach you about the Trinity. Trinity is not in the scripture, it's an idol. The Trinity exposed number 24. Trinity triplets? Sure, why not? Um, I'm going to put up a picture here. A Roman Catholic drawing of uh, three Jesus triplets. And this is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the way you can tell the difference is by looking at their shirt there, the little emblem that they have on their shirt. That's how you can tell them apart. Other than that, they're identical twins, or identical triplets, excuse me. Uh, so here's the picture. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, they're just stepping on these little headless children with wings. You know, that's that's in the scripture somewhere. I know it has to be someplace, yeah. But uh, absolutely absurd. Unless you believe in the Catholic Trinity, well then, you know, maybe it'll look like something like that or some of the other things like the one that appears at the beginning of the video. They're worshiping an idol. It's the Godhead bodily. Verse 10, and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. So the fullness of the Godhead bodily is right here in front of us until he returns. This is the Godhead. The Godhead. This is what he's talking about. Then Psalms 56, 5. Go back to Psalms. Every day they rest my words. You ever hear somebody twisting the scriptures right in front of you? Like telling you, oh, we sinned in the past, we can't sin anymore? No. Anyone that says we're out without sin is a liar, God says. So every day they rest my words, and their thoughts are against me for evil. All those people, they're going to speak out against this book, the King James Bible. They're going to do it. You'll know them. I hear it almost every day. People speaking out against God's word. Resting with the words of his book. His book. Easter can't be in your Bible. Blah, blah, blah. This, that. Go to Psalms 107. We're in Psalms. Go to one, Psalms 107. Looks at the words of God here. Psalms 107. 107. Starting in verse 10. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High. You know, when you speak out of the King James Bible, you're the counsel of the Most High. God's speaking through you with his words that you're speaking out loud. You're the counsel of the Most They'll speak out against you, these guys. They'll tell you there's mistakes in your Bible. There's not a single mistake in the King James Bible. Condemn the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. No one's going to help these guys. They, they just get themselves lost because they spoke against God's word. He makes sure they're lost. He sends them astray. So God says you're helpless if you rebel against his words. Don't ever rebel against his book. Don't ever rebel against these words. You're helpless. He'll make you helpless. Jeremiah 19.15. That's just a little bit over about 50 pages to the right here, further in. Jeremiah 19.15. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon this city and upon all her towns 
all the evil that I have pronounced against it, because they have heard in their necks that they might not hear my words. Don't ever put this Bible aside and not read it if you're prompted to read it. If something's troubling you, go to the, go to the book of Proverbs. Read a proverb. It'll calm you down. It'll clean your heart. If you speak out against this book, God will go hard in your neck. And you won't be able to hear him, God's telling us. You won't be able to hear him. Okay, let's go to the book of Ezekiel now. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel. It's just after Jeremiah 907. Verse uh, the, chapter 35. Verse 13, 35, 13. Thus with your mouth ye have boasted against me and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. When you speak out against God and his words, he hears you, you know that? He hears you. How many people have I heard speak out against the word Easter and, 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 and against the Son of God, which is in Daniel 3.25? There's four men in the furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but there's three men in the furnace, but King Nebuchadnezzar saw a fourth man. And he said, hey, it looks like the Son of God. And all the crop Bibles, including the Staten Vertelling and the Dutch Bibles, by the way, they all say, a son of the gods, like Thor and that. And they speak out against me when I say he's a son of God. No, 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 that king wasn't saved, so he didn't know any better. That's why he said that. No, God's word is the Son of God. It was Jesus Christ in that furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Any pastor who tells you anything else is a liar. So I, I, I just can't count them anymore. And then Isaiah 14, 12, it says uh, 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 morning star instead of Lucifer. Changes Jesus Christ into Lucifer. But rest assured, God has heard these men. God has heard you if you spoke out against the word. God has heard you. And Matthew 12, 32. Matthew 12, 32. Then we'll be in the New Testament here. Matthew 12, 32. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, listen carefully now, whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. So you might say something against Jesus in a joke or something, it'll be forgiven you. But I, I wouldn't want to try that. <laughs> but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven of him. It shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world or neither in the world to come. It'll never be forgiven. You speak out against the Holy Ghost? Boy, you better be careful what you're saying when you speak out against the word here. So this book is the Godhead. He left us believers here on earth. He left this for us. He said he'd preserve his word and we have him in front of our hands today. Do you know how, how important this book is to you? This book is life. So the Holy Ghost is in the Godhead. If you speak out against this book, it shall not be forgiven to you. And your neck will be hardened. Your neck will be hardened. You probably will never get to know God. Boy, well, you don't want to get your neck hardened. So God's word speaks to us every day through our company. Every day through our company. We try precious metals to get the analytical data to our clients. It's what we have to do. By trying the samples they send us in fire. Just like God will try us in, in the fire of his word. So what we do is we, we, we melt the rock. Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll, get, uh, we'll get a rock. A rock. Yeah, a rock here. See, we get a rock sample. This one here carries about a million. A million uh, parts per billion. A million parts per billion of gold. Because in this particular case the client asks us to look for gold but we're actually we're looking for silver and other elements too so this is it looks just a rock but it's a quartzite rock and it's got veins of gold in it 
So in a, in a sample like this, is disseminated gold. So this this is this is placer gold. It's vein gold. This is disseminated gold. And this disseminated gold, the gold is disseminated all through the ore, and it may be as much as a hundred thousand parts per, per per billion of gold in this particular sample. Now this is when we assay gold at one time, and, and the clients brought these. These are old samples. And then what we do is we put that in a, in a crucible. Now you're going to find we're going to study the word crucible here right away. You put that in a crucible, and this crucible. It's made of clay, and it'll take about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And we put it in a crucible with a nice eutectic mixture of flak borax. So these are the crucibles. We mixed uh, borax, we mixed uh, uh, soda ash, we mixed litharge, we mixed the uh, baker's flour, and we've actually put a, a known amount of one assay ton, which is 29.166 grams of sample in these. We're going to mix it up really good. And then we're going to do a silver in quartz. The reason we're doing a silver in quartz, in this case, we're looking for the metal gold. Borax, uh, 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 some litharge as a, as a collector, which is, which is a lead oxide, lead monoxide. And then uh, we melt that down. So here he's pouring off the sample so that the slag comes up, which is the dross. And the... Uh, Precious metals and heavy metals fall down to the bottom, gravimetrically. And the lead showers down through the sample. At any rate, what we end up with is a lead button. And then we put that lead button in one of these cupels, which absorbs it. Then we end up with a silver bead because we incorporate silver into every sample. Oh, yes. Okay. And these are after we poured the, uh, poured the gravimetrically, pulled out all the, the precious metals, we end up with this lead button. And this lead silver button, is, we're going to melt it in these cupels which are made out of magnesium and the, and the cupels will absorb the lead and it'll leave the uh, silver bead on top and any other uh, precious or noble metals will be in that silver bead. We're going to insert them now into the oven. He's going to insert uh, 40 samples in, in, in one shot into the uh, uh, cupellation oven for cupellation. And this oven will run at about 1,680 degrees, and we'll put the uh, cupels in, and allow the uh, lead to melt out, and end up with our silver uh, noble metal alloy. And that silver bead, we're going to part away the silver with various types of nitric acids in a crucible, and this is a porcelain crucible. And in this crucible, we're going to part away that silver, and we're going to end up with gold if we're looking for gold. That's how we do a gold assay. But this, this would be like a silver ingot that we make the silver nitrate solution from. So in the cupel, it starts like this. It's like magnesium, this one. And then it'll absorb any lead and impurities, all the dross. It absorbs all the dross. Remember that word, because we're going to study dross now. All the dross. And then we end up with our silver bead. So, uh, of course, we do a, a modern, a more modern, modern method and that's we use a spectrophotometer and in the spectrophotometer what it does is we take uh, when the when the sample's in solution we put the sample into solution with a very strong acid so any gold and silver and other elements are in solution and when that's in solution we have to <coughs> aspirate it into a flame and turn it into an atomic vapor okay so the chemist here will be uh, standardizing the machine by entering known values of, of uh, solution in this case be doing gold, she's doing a sample for a gold test, a gold solution show. And that atomic vapor, everything's atomized into the spectrum of colors, which is the rainbow. You see the rainbow after, after a, a, a rain? So we're going to enter three known standard values, and that'll give us an absorbance, and based on that absorbance, we're going to be able to determine a parts per billion uh, analysis on this uh, analysis on the solution. That's actually the different minerals you're seeing creating those colors, different minerals that are that are liberated in the air. Okay, now uh, the the sample is a uh, it's it's uh, it's in solution, so the sample's in solution, and in this case she's going to aspirate the solution and create an atomic vapor, and that atomic vapor is going to turn into the colors of the rainbow, and the light will. Uh, emit through the rainbow in a beam and pick up the amount of gold because gold has its own color in the rainbow. So, and of course there's seven of them and the gay flag is six, but that's another story. But anyhow, how we would read that in the spectrophotometers, we have here a hollow cathode lamp. And this lamp 
has an anode, an anode up here, and a cathode. And this anode and cathode, when we apply a current to it, turns into a plasma. And this plasma then shoots out this beam. Shoo! And this beam, the plasma in here, like for example, this is a, a this will be an osmium lamp. So we'll be looking for osmium. There's actually the element osmium in the end of that uh, cathode. And the osmium will create a plasma and shoot out a beam because the, the, the molecules get really excited. And it turns into an ionizing gas in here shooting out this beam. And the beam will go through your flame, through the rain, little rainbow, and it look for all the osmium in the rainbow. And the machine will tell us exactly what's there. When you see a rainbow in the sky, of course, you're seeing the different elements. These elements uh, all have a different color, emit a different color, just like stained glass in old windows. A gold stained glass is from actual gold that's in the glass. And uh, a blue stained glass is from actual cobalt in the glass. And so she'll get these determinations on here. And then uh, in this case it's over range, so she'll dilute them and get a proper determination. So what's happening here, she's aspirating the solution that's going up into an atomic vapor through this flame. It, it, the flame atomizes the sample, turning it into an atomic vapor to create the rainbow spectrum. So we can see the colors, and of course it's not the gay rainbow, this is the real rainbow of God. It's got seven colors, the gay's only got six. But it's not, a, it's not a completely proven method. It's proven, but it's not as accurate as fire assay is the first method we talked about. And the fire assay, trying in fire, is in the scriptures for 6,000 years now. It hasn't changed. The procedure hasn't changed. It's a perfect method. It's why we still use it at our work. It's, it's, it's tried and proven. Okay, make sure you get a good grip of that before you pull it out. Okay. Okay, careful. Careful. It's very hot, 2,300 degrees. Okay, firing silver in the earth kilns, we're going to fire them up to seven times, make it pure. Okay, you're right over, okay, keep that off, yeah, don't touch it to the, to the slag, yeah, keep it up in the air, that's it. Now flip that thing over and get it to the back of the, yeah, that's beautiful. Good job. Okay. Okay, wait. There you go. There. You can't beat it. You can't can't beat it for accuracy. So God refers to assaying, which means to try. To try. Assaying is to try. Many times throughout the scriptures, he actually calls trying assaying. And we'll start in Hebrews eleven twenty nine to see what God says about it here. Let's go to God. Hebrews 11, 29. Now this is actually, we're going back to when the children were in, uh, we're looking at the Old Testament here through the Old Testament, through a lens darkly. Hebrews 11.29 is by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land which the Egyptians assaying to do were drowned. Yes, assaying in the Bible. What are they doing? They were trying. They were trying to get through just like the Israelites did. But they drowned doing it. So the Egyptians tried to get through that Red Sea baptism. Yeah, it was a baptism. But they drowned in the process because they were in unbelief. They didn't believe God. They didn't believe Moses when he spoke God's words. They were in unbelief. They didn't believe what we have today, this book.
and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire.